we've focused a lot um, in, in some of the presentations on some of humanity's strengths. Um, and as a result, one audience member thinks some of the talk sounded a bit one-dimensional or self-congratulatory mm -hmm. um, for human beings. But I think to, to take that in a direction, it's not just that, so we focused, one example of that might be we focused on the ways that computers and machines can replace us mm -hmm. in, the, in the workplace. Um, but it's really not just that, it seems to me, um, that computers and machines do things that we can do, but rather in some instances, and this was a main point that you really mm -hmm. came to, in some instances they do things better, and in right. some instances they do things worse, mm -hmm. and in some instances they don't do them at all. Um, but there are, uh, maybe it's helpful to sort of tease out what some of those things, some of those ways that they actually help us do things better. So the example given here is they don't get fatigued, mm -hmm. they don't have biases. Mm -hmm. um, Take oh, yes, they there. do. They do have, well, they have biases, you know, like, but they're biases for machine learning in which they've, of course, had to sort of learn from the data of, of human actions and things like that. Um, but they, in, in, and Bob is actually really well placed to answer this, so I think some of this stuff is kind of obvious, is that machines do a lot of stuff way better than us, right? But we never th thought, oh, man, now we've made wheelbarrows. It makes us less important in the scheme of things. I'm kind of cosmically depressed because of wheelbarrows, right? Uh, it's, <laughs> but we make them because it, they carry things better than we do. We use horses because they're stronger than us, right? And so the things that we use machines for, we make them to do some discrete thing better than us. And so we should expect that. Why would we bother if they didn't do things better than we can do or they do some, thi some things we can't possibly do? And they will do things, robots will do things that are very, very dangerous that we'd pr rather not have humans have to do, for instance. And so I actually think, for instance, a lot of people are skeptical about self-driving cars. I'm not at all. I actually think that that's right around the corner. Um, I, now, the really difficult task will be farther out. Um, I think a lot of the things that you hear about, I think most of that stuff will actually happen. Um, it may, it depends on the timeline. I just think that that's because of the amazing human ingenuity that we're able to create these things. And so it doesn't, it does, I don't think that sort of changes our place in the scheme of the universe. If anything, it, you know, if you look at it properly, I would say it should give us awe that God could create us. Um, as Thomas Aquinas said, God grants to creatures the dignity of causality. So in other words, he doesn't hoard all the causal power in himself. He creates creatures and he creates a world and then he creates little creators that he lets also create. I think that should be awe-inspiring. And so don't, at least don't count me as a sort of Luddite that thinks, you know, this stuff isn't going to happen. I think actually most of it will happen, and that's why I think the disruption will be so severe. Yeah, in terms of bias, do you think Google can ever write an algorithm that filters out all hate speech? They think they can. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's any doubt that they will write an algorithm that uh, this is Christians who don't buy into the LGBT? Absolutely. It is the bias which is actually placed in the computer program and the algorithm by the programmer. In fact, in I think it was 1998, there was a great disruptive paper published in computer science called the No Free Lunch Theorem, which says that an algorithm will do nothing without the imposed bias of the programmer. So that bias will always show up one way or another. Well, I've been waiting for months as we prepare for this to ask this one question, so I, I, I am going to ask it. I kind of have a dream of living in the country and working in the city and using my morning commute to drink coffee and reply, to, reply to email and one of these autonomous mm -hmm. vehicles since those came up. But I have a, a, a worry as a philosopher about, as a student of philosophy about that, and that is when I'm in that car, I know whose ethical system is controlling the situation or controlling the car when I'm driving. It's mine. So I know when there are risks to be taken, when there are choices to be made about whom to endanger myself or others, I know uh, who's making that choice. If I have a, an automated vehicle and can enjoy my morning coffee and reply to those emails on the, on the, on the way to work, whose ethical system will be programmed in? And I'm asking this as a, yeah. they're actually doing this, so somebody's ethical system is going to be there, or will there be a knob? Can I choose today for my, my car to be a deontological car, and tomorrow can I switch it over to virtue ethics, or 
or, or get really, I'm, I'm feeling sort of suicidal, so I'll be utilitarian today. Or what, what's, <laughs> what it's, work? I mean, the way in which autonomous cars are working is that there, there's not a one person literally programming it do this. What's happening is it's there's a system, a network system of it's collecting data of actual drivers and what they do, right? And so it's building up a kind of statistical analysis of what people do when they come to stop signs. And then the data gets large enough. And remember, autonomous cars don't have to be perfect. They just have to be better, we talked about this at lunch, than humans, who are terrible drivers, right? <laughs> if it's a very low bar. Uh, that's all. They just have to be better than that. And so the, where accidents happen is actually in last minute decisions, basically, in which you're, you know, you, your tail spins, you forget what to do, and you, you, know, you swerve and miss the uh, squirrel and hit the school, right? I mean, it, it's not, that was in, in that case, it wasn't an ethical choice, it was a sort of panic choice. And so what's gonna happen is that on the assumption that, say, the Google car drivers are normally not you know, running over school children and things like that. That's actually, it, it's statistical rather than, there's not, not this kind of deductive algorithm that says if this happens, do this. It's after millions and millions of miles of good drivers doing good things, collecting that data, then it kind of back, sort of back programs itself into this thing and it becomes better and better and better over time. Um, and that's what's happened. I mean, uh, Uber has a fleet of Volvo XC90s in Pittsburgh right now doing fairly designated routes, but doing a really good job. Google has millions and millions of miles of self-driving cars and only a couple of accidents. Um, Long-haul trucking, it's actually an easy problem compared to driving in, say, Austin or Seattle. And that has huge implications because long-haul trucking is the number one job for men in many states. And so that's a huge economic thing. And people are skeptical of this, but I can tell you, I was skeptical about natural language uh, even 10 years ago. Um, and they're, it's getting really good. And so if you can master natural language, I think driving cars better than we can is not going to be all that hard. Okay, Dr. Marks, this one came in. For you, uh, Dr. Mark said there are two buzzwords that articles use to hype AI, uh, one having to do with consciousness and self-awareness. Uh, he touched on self-awareness in an analogy. Can we get a working definition of consciousness? Um, and also, I would kind of append to that, why isn't consciousness possible for, for a computer? Well, you're not going to get a definition of consciousness from me because I think I'm conscience, conscious. I can't even say the word. I'm not sure about other people. I'm not sure if you're conscious. <laughs> so, um, you know, in terms of defining, I read books about quantum consciousness and the idea that consciousness is part of the universe, just like matter and energy. And I, I don't know what they're talking about. I don't want to know what consciousness is. I think we can probably make a, uh, an attempt to define it but actually to capture it, to quantize it, I don't know if that's possible. What do you think? Well, I would say consciousness is at least, rather than trying to give an exhaustive definition, we know consciousness primarily directly, right, and introspectively. We might not even, you know, if we are not ourselves conscious, it wouldn't occur to us, right? <laughs> it's kind of tautology, obviously. It's at very least uh, first-person subjective experience. So this capacity to have experience and then to reflect on it. Uh, it's minimally that, it's not only that. And I would say with respect to machines, there's just absolutely no reason to think that a computer is gonna become conscious than to think that if you make a tractor big enough, it's gonna become an ox or a rhinoceros. Why would you think that? We know what's happening in machines. We don't actually know what's happening here, but we do know that we're conscious. We do know that it's com connected in some complex way to our brains and our bodies. We don't fully understand it. We know, you know, we, we know they're related and correlated. And so we re reasonably uh, uh, can infer that we are conscious, right? In fact, I think infallibly, if you're doing that, you're thinking about it, then you are. Um, and then we infer that others who act like us are, uh, that are like us in, with, in particular ways. And then what, what do we do? We aren't sure when it comes to certain animals. Not sure, okay, is this cat conscious slightly less than me? Well, he seems vindictive, so yeah, maybe so, <laughs> all right? And, and so I would say those are boundary conditions, and it's because they're biological organisms that are similar to us in certain ways. These machines are only similar to us in particular ways that we have made them like us in their behavior. But there's nothing happening physically. There's just absolutely no reason to think it. And so I think it's, it's almost entirely the, an artifact of 
our, our sloppy ways of speaking. We talk about neural nets and machine learning and artificial intelligence, and we start to believe it, especially if we watch Star Trek and things like that. <laughs> and so that's, I would just say, why, why on earth would, you know, give me a reason to think that, there's, that these things would become conscious. Uh, Unless so we're in the matrix, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But even that, see, yeah, even if we're in the matrix, notice the matrix doesn't generate the first person subjective experience of the people in the matrix, it only creates illusions of what they're experiencing, right? And so if somebody says, well, we're in a simulation, apparently Elon Musk thinks this. Uh, again, California, drugs, I mean, you end <laughs> up, uh, yeah. Um, what does it even mean to say that you can create a computer program that has first person, that makes you think you have first person subjective experience? I don't even think it, I don't even think it's coherent. I just, I just don't think it makes sense. Well, this next question is related to that one in that in the, uh, consciousness and sort of learning go, go together. Um, as humans, we learn do's and don'ts, building up a huge if-then spreadsheet, if you will. How does this differ from procedural learning or neural networks? I can actually, I can actually address that. Early AI, as formed by Marvin Minsky at MIT, was very interested in what was then called artificial intelligence, which was the idea of extracting information from experts and translating it into computer code. This was in contrast to what used to be called connectionist. Everybody thinks they know what AI is, but if you go back historically, uh, there's distinctions between AI and neural networks and connectionist sort of models. So the if-then sort of thing was the Marvin Minsky sort of way of doing things. Neural networks came along and they said, well, you know, really we don't need to do that. We don't need uh, antecedents and consequences and if-then statements. Rather, what we're going to do is we're going to subject a learning system to a bunch of data. I like, have you ever seen the movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers? Mm -hmm. Great 1950s movies where they used to put a pod next to a person and, uh, and the pod came, started to take the shape of the person and then eventually killed it. But that analogy goes too far. <laughs> uh, but but the, uh, the, the pod actually imitated the person. That's what a neural network does. A neural network takes a piece of data and then attempts to generate a system inside the neural network that it's able to replicate that data. It becomes kind of an empirical model, a trained model that generates that data. And that is fundamentally what a neural network does. It's not a bunch of if-then rules. The greatest uh, advance in if-then rules was uh, started in the 90s by the Japanese in so-called fuzzy logic. Yes, there is something called fuzzy logic. I remember in the campaign, somebody called George Bush's math. No, Bush called Reagan. Yeah. Fuzzy math. Yeah, fuzzy math. And I, I looked up on my shelf, and there was a book called Fuzzy Arithmetic, <laughs> really. Uh, so it's, it's a serious, it's a serious uh, way of doing things. But fu fuzzy, uh, fuzzy logic actually works the same way we do. If we tell a car to back up, we say, come on back, come on back, slow, 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 or stop. Now, that's not a way a computer would do. It would say, come back. 3.6 feet, decelerate to stop, something like that. But we use something called fuzzy linguistic variables to communicate. Come on back faster. Faster, if I say faster, it doesn't mean the same to you and me. But some way, this mm -hmm. works incredible. So the Japanese took this and they, they applied it to washing machines. They, they applied it to popcorn poppers. How would they do that? Well, if the load is heavy and the water is dirty, then you wash for a long time. Okay, and so how do you take a, a sequence of statements like that, actually reduce it to machine code? So indeed, there is part of that, and I think that we're probably seeing hybrid sort of things where there is human intelligence and this neural network happening at the same time. Watson, for example, had a lot of human help in, in terms of bringing it to fruition. Mm -hmm. So there's usually a human in the loop somewhere. The human in the loop that uh, is designing things, and uh, that's, that's what makes the artificial intelligence works. Well, I think one of the most helpful things about having the two of you here together is to get a real sense of uh, a thorough, a sort. Of, even though I'm sure there are things about which you disagree, there are some fundamentals where you do agree, and we get a, a really deep sense across a number of disciplines, engineering, economics, mm -hmm. philosophy, epistemology, ontology, um, of, of one particular way of viewing it. We had a great question come in about the alternatives, um, saying Dr. Marx began his presentation by acknowledging brilliant thinkers who fear, or at least take seriously, the notion that machines might be able to evolve beyond their programmer's control. 
Uh, he seems to belong to a different school of thought, but it's difficult for me to dismiss those thinkers outright. What Absolutely. accounts for the disparity in the schools of thought? Well, I can address that with Bill Gates. Um, Bill Gates was not a good computer scientist. He was a great, <laughs> he was a great entrepreneur. And I've had arguments with people trying to have them tell me anything Microsoft ever did, which was technically innovative. Uh, they took Excel from Lotus 123. They took Windows Explorer from Netscape. They took Word, Word for Windows from um, Word Perfect. Word Perfect. Yeah. Uh, they bought PowerPoint. Uh, the guy, so everything. Uh, they were good at that, they, though. They were, really, <laughs> they were really good at that. But it, it means that Bill Gates and his father, who was a lawyer, mm -hmm. that's one of the. I did some consulting for Microsoft. You know what? The first thing they did, I met. First thing they did when I consulted for Microsoft, they got me in a room, and they said, um, "Okay, here come the lawyers." So the lawyers came in, and they says, "Well, you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that." Everything you do, we own. You're not allowed to look at any patents. I said, not allowed to look at any patents. They said, no, because if we're sued, they said if they can prove you look at patents, they get punitive damages. So all of a sudden, the, this lawyer sort of uh, centric thing was in Microsoft. So I don't want to discount Bill Gates. He's obviously an incredibly brilliant man, but I would not put him as an expert in artificial intelligence. Stephen Hawking is clearly brilliant. He, uh, he's, he's done some stuff with, uh, with black holes. He's been able to do things because of, his, because of his Lou Gehrig's disease in his mind, which is just incredibly mind-blowing. But he has a colleague, Roger Penrose, who would disagree with him. Roger Penrose worked with Stephen Hawking on the black hole singularity theorem and uh, was, was instrumental in, in, in publishing that. Roger Penrose would disagree with Stephen Hawking. Roger Penrose basically said man will create a computer, but a computer will never create man. So it's never going to, it's never going to happen this way. Roger Penrose is what I read initially, which got me to think about the algorithmic versus the non-algorithmic. And so here we have two great minds, Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose, mm -hmm. who totally disagree on what computers can and can't do. And I don't want to say anything disparaging about Stephen Hawking is a lot smarter guy than me, but I, I just wonder if he's gone back and looked at the fundamentals like we talked about, the fundamentals of computer science. Elon Musk, as I mentioned, George Gilder says, he's an incredible entrepreneur, but rather a retarded thinker. So all of this stuff about, uh, about AI and, uh, and, and, and the fact that we live in the matrix, that we are simulations of high, some higher intelligences, yeah, it's kind of weird, it's kind of far out there. And he smokes pot, too. <laughs> but I think it's important to distinguish something, is that a, what, what's happening here is not a debate between people that are some smart people and some dumb people. It's a debate between people, generally, that have fundamentally different assumptions about reality. Yes. And so if you notice, almost to, to a man, in fact, it is a, almost all men that are worried about this. I'm wondering if there's not a defect there, that are worried about the strong AI stuff, now I'm thinking about it. Um, <laughs> are strong AI proponents. They, first of all, they do think that we are machines. Nick Bostrom, the transhumanist, they, they think this quite explicitly, and so they're basically making deductions from their, their worldview assumptions. Now you can say, well, we're doing that too. Well, in a sense, we're saying, actually, we think that the facts fit our view of reality better, but at the same time, we're also making risky predictions. So these things are testable. Right? We're, we're saying machines are not going to become conscious. Now, we're, we have things to worry about with smart missiles and things like that, but the thing to worry about is not that the missile will wake up and decide to kill you instead of somebody else. It's, it's another problem. And so because we're making claims about reality and what's going to happen in the near future, we're going to actually be able to test, in a sense, different metaphysical assumptions about the truth about reality and human persons, which is honestly the reason I'm interested in this subject. I also think to, to build on that, if I, I don't know about Bill Gates, but Stephen Hawking certainly was a materialist, a humanist. And therefore, if you are a materialist, the only game in town mm -hmm. is that what we do must have a materialistic computer uh, solution. And therefore, that's the only game that they can play. Yeah. Great. I want to see if I can squeeze in a couple of really practical, we turn now from the really high level, fundamental 30,000 foot disagreements mm -hmm. to some really practical questions that got sent in. I thought this was a terrific one. What moral responsibilities, in light of all that you've said, does the common person have in their choice of device, software, or medium when it comes to the consumption 
and use of technology? That's easily reduced to a principle, is to make sure that your use uh, and your use of any technology, you maximize the benefits and reduce the cost. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that, I mean, that is essentially it. When we're not talking about intrinsic evils, obviously, right? Uh, we're talking about, okay, checking Facebook or using a smartphone, is that we have to adapt both culturally uh, and personally to each new innovation. I can remember there was a time when I was in high school when doctors had beepers and they would go off in church. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, people are generally pretty good about turning off their smartphones, you know, in, in church now, whereas it was bad. And so in some ways, uh, we have to constantly be adapting to this. And so I don't think, in, in, in some ways, there's no kind of new dilemma. It's just that we devise ever better and more high resolution ways to, to sin in, in the old timey way, right? So there's lust has always existed. Sex robots, that's a new thing, right? <laughs> um, and so I, th those are the kinds of things. And that's actually the stuff I think if you want to worry about something, worry and focus on those really practical things and how you're going to, especially with children whose brains are still in formation, right? Uh, and this stuff has a, an effect. Um, in, in which you acclimate. I don't, think, I don't think you want to try to, you know, just get yourself completely off the grid. I would say the model is something like inoculation, right? So you don't want to quarantine your children because they're liable to get out and get exposed anyway, but you don't want to overexpose them. You want them inoculated so that they build up resistance to all these things and know how to use them and know how to maximize the benefits and, and limit the cost. The only immoral software I'm aware of is Microsoft Vista. <laughs> um, and it got its just reward. <laughs> it got its, it got its, it's got its just reward. Uh, in terms of morality and immorality, I don't think I don't think there's an easy question to that, or an easy answer to that. Um, so yeah, I was going to say something, but it slipped my mind. That's okay. Here. So we got okay. another another question about these economic matters. Um, must Oh, I remember what it was. Oh, sure. sure. Go okay. ahead. I think a big thing that we have to worry about is digital wellness <laughs> in, in terms of the impact of software that we all have. About a month ago, my wife bought, here's my fetching wife, Monica, up here. Uh, she bought something very expensive on Amazon, my da and I share it with my daughter. And here's a place where AI needs removed. When you share Amazon with your daughter, you get notices about buying diapers and uh, things like that. Uh, but and boots, it, and high, boots, high leather boots, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, you get all this cross, uh, cross stuff. But anyway, my daughter had this, she, she mistakenly charged up my daughter's account. She, my daughter saw it, and uh, so she canceled her credit card. So Amazon canceled our whole account. My goodness, did I have withdrawals. No more Alexa, no more two-day uh, delivery, no more Amazon streaming video. It was heck. I had withdrawal <laughs> symptoms for, for a couple of weeks, and I thought I was probably a pretty digitally well person, but boy, was I, was I sure. addicted to Amazon. And I just, I, I just wonder, these pictures of you know, kids sitting around doing all their cell phones, uh, the overall impact of digital wellness, and I mm -hmm. think that that's probably maybe the most important near-term thing we have to address. Yeah, we have a question about that, in fact, that the, uh, relatedly, the algorithms on Netflix and YouTube have become very adept at predicting shows that we will like based on previous content that we have watched. Do you foresee AI having the ability to curate content in such a way that it becomes essentially irresistible because they've gotten so good at knowing exactly what we want to see next? I don't know. It's not there yet. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. I spend a lot of time clicking through, um, you know. <laughs> I mean, the truth of the matter is, is we always have to discipline ourselves. I mean, this is, I, I don't, pl I'm protected from the first person games, you know, like world, any of these games in which you're, you know, seeing things from your own perspective because I get motion sickness. But I know when I play them, I feel the addictive quality to it. And so I think that kind of addictive quality of really, really good technology is going to be a problem. Um, but again, I mean, I think it just like any kind of addictive thing can also be fun. It can be a diversion. It can be beneficial or it can be destructive. I think actually Madison Avenue has attempted to uh, seduce us into uh, getting a lot of attention to their ads for a long time. I don't know if AI has improved that very much. Uh, at least it hasn't for me. I look at my Netflix suggestions and eh, no, they're, they're no good. Mm -hmm. Well, on both the uh, utopian and dystopian looks mm -hmm. at work, so turning back to work for just a minute, um, as one of the questioners asked, 
does work have to go with money? Um, or, right. or can we view the possibility that AI will take a lot of both these manual labor jobs like automobile yeah. factories and also the financial analysis, right, TPS reports from office space, mm -hmm. um, that a lot of that will be eliminated. Will it free us, th this is a bit in the utopian yeah. view, why, why is the utopian view wrong to see that we could separate work from money? Yeah, well, and this is a good question, but I mean, the question is what is money? Uh, and so money in an economy is usually a signal that, you know, if you're, you're getting, let's say you go to the grocery store, right? If you leave with groceries and the grocer ends up with your money, did he play rock, paper, scissors with you and say, okay, if I win, you give me your money? No, I mean, what the money was, it was a signal, and you wanted the groceries more than you wanted the money, and he wanted the money more than he wanted the groceries, so it's mutually beneficial. And so in market exchanges, money's actually just a signal that, okay, well, I provided something for someone. Um, we already have hobbies. What's the difference between a hobby and work? Well, hobby is something that's a self-diversion that you do just because you enjoy it, but it doesn't necessarily create value for other people. I actually do think that there is something deeply related. That, that's fun, and that's something that we often do, and maybe we, we already have more time, I think, for hobbies than we did in the past. Nevertheless, I think that if we spent our time just on hobbies, that's the way I would frame it, all the time, so just self-regarding diversions, and never produced anything of value to other people or something that people needed, I think we wouldn't actually be fulfilling our creation mandate, and I suspect we'd actually be depressed. Uh, we'd be like Benjamin Braddock, you know, on the, the graduate. You know, it's kind of fun to float in the water for a couple of weeks, but you get to August and you're not doing anything and you get depressed. Um, and so I, I think that's why I think work, it's, money is just a kind of, a, a, a kind of it's a representation of, of value. The way I would think of it is what work is, as opposed to a hobby, is that you are creating value for others. And then if you're doing it in a way that's successful, it also redounds to your own benefit. Well, I think what's vitally important, what we've just gotten some clarity on, what's vitally important at sessions like this is that one tension I see in the history of technology and technological development is that our, our ability to do something always outpaces our thoughtfulness about doing it. Mm -hmm. And so it's extremely important for every single one of us to have sufficient technical knowledge, which we can get from, from experts, in order to do the heavy thinking that we each have to do as, as some of these great questions indicated about um, how to respond to those new realities and new technologies and not, because either we will manage them or they will manage us. And so I'd like to thank both of our presenters tonight for fantastic presentations that have given us all a lot to think about. There were loads more questions. Maybe you can rush up here and ask some of them afterwards sure. uh, that we didn't get to. Um, but a special thank you to Christchurch mm -hmm. for all of the work, for all of their hosting. This was a wonderful event uh, and a great time. And thank you all very much. And thank you for coming. Thank you.